Hey everybody, it's Melissa Ramos, nutritionist with a background in Chinese medicine and also the owner of Sexy Food Therapy. And today I'm really excited because I got my girl Alexandra Jameson in the house <laughs> talking all about her fantastic book that I am so excited to share with you guys because if you haven't picked up this book, you gotta. Um, it is called Women, Food, and Desire. It says embrace your cravings, make peace with you food and reclaim your body. And this is amazing. And you've done so well with this. And like, how many languages is it translated into now? Um, seven or eight. I just saw one for like, what, Taiwan? It's coming out in Taiwan oh. in October. I'm so excited. I have no idea what the cover says, but it looks <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Girl, you're killing it. You're killing it. This is fantastic. And I think that this, we finally have a book that really nails it in terms of what women need to understand why they're emotionally eating, the disconnect that they're having with their bodies on so many different levels. So I guess the first thing is first is what was your motivation in terms of writing this book? Like, Where did it all come from? Well, I've been working with women for 14 years, but my own journey with food has been very complicated and very messy. Um, I grew up on an old organic farm outside of Portland, Oregon. Mm. My mom had an organic gardening radio show for a decade in the 70s and 80s. So I knew where my food came from. I knew how to grow. I, I mean, people had children to grow their food back in the day, and that was true for my hippie <laughs> parents. But I was also a serious sugar addict. And I found out there was a church down the street where the kids at Sunday school got Kool-Aid and cookies. So I started going to Sunday school by myself <laughs> at the age of seven just to get sugar, basically. Wow. And I continued to just eat as much junk food as I could get out of the house because my parents didn't have it in the house. And by the time I reached my mid-20s, I was really sick. And I had full-on candida yeast overgrowth. I was having migraine headaches almost every day, exhausted. I was 30 pounds heavier than I had been in college and depressed. And I went to a doctor, you know, a traditional, well, not traditional, but a standard Western doctor yeah. who within a few minutes, I had Prozac and painkiller prescriptions. And wow. my body just went, Ooh! I was scared to go down that road. Yeah. And I knew it wasn't going to fix the problem, but I didn't really know what was wrong. So I went to another doctor who, you know, with the Buddha and ferns in his office. <laughs> and he asked me what I was eating. Now, this was night. This was 2000. So there was not a Whole Foods in every neighborhood in New York City like there is now where I live. And I did not know how to cook. He gave me a list of foods to eat and a list of foods to avoid. And I almost cried because that was everything I ate. And you're like, this is so overwhelming. How do I eat? How do I eat? I didn't know any people who ate like this. Yeah. But I started reading books and I discovered veganism and I was like, oh my gosh, this sounds amazing. Like I can protect the environment and I like animals and it sounds like a healthy way to eat. So I'll give it a try. And it was, you know, I went off sugar and off of all animal products and I felt amazing within a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. Like my whole body, my whole life changed. And I had hit bottom, so it was easy for me at that point to avoid sugar because I was so, so sick. But, you know, I, I didn't do it perfectly and the cravings were still there, but I knew that I was healing my body and that was the reason to move forward. So here I am like, diving into this healthy lifestyle, new diet. And of course, I start go working in a smoky bar serving beer to people at night <laughs> so that I can make rent money to go to healthy cooking school during the day. I know how that feels. <laughs> <laughs> and while I was at work one night, I saw this cute guy and I picked him up. His name was Morgan and he was a budding filmmaker. And the two of us started dating. And between all of our conversations, we came up with the idea for Super Size Me, uh -huh. where he ate nothing but McDonald's and got really, really sick. And I was the only one who said, oh, my gosh, you're going to get so sick. And all of his doctors were like, you'll be fine. <laughs> and, you know, sh long story short, the movie's a huge success. And I end up writing three vegan cookbooks after that. And I was professionally vegan for 10 years and happily living my life. 
But then fast forward to mid, my mid-30s now, and I've had a child. I'm now going through a divorce, very stressed out, and your body starts changing as you get older. My hormones tanked. I was severely anemic. My menstrual cycle was like every 14, 16 days. Wow. And I was trying everything in the vegan framework to deal with this. And nothing was working. And I started craving meat. This was not good. This no, was- especially when you're this professional, like, vegan chef with all these cookbooks and, you know, a, a huge documentary where you were a professed vegan. Yes, yes. And so I struggled with this for over a year. And I didn't tell anyone because I had seen what had happened to a couple of people when they like started eating meat again for whatever reason. It was vicious. So I, I just kept it a secret. But then I realized I'm coaching people. I'm helping them find the, the best foods that work for their body. And I'm not allowing myself the same freedom. Totally. If my body's craving this food, maybe I should try it. Yeah. And I finally started secretly eating meat. And lo and behold, my body felt so much better. Oh my gosh! How I mean, you feel in the grocery stores. Were you like sneaking like steaks or something in I was underneath? Eating it under the kale <laughs> in my basket <laughs> so that nobody would see me. Oh so I was, I was developing disordered eating. I was now obsessed Shame. and ashamed and mentally, you know, even though physically my body was feeling better, emotionally I was a wreck. Yeah. So I thought, I can't be a good person and eat meat. What about all these things that I've said? And after about a year of this back and forth thing, I realized I just, I need to be straight with the world and say, this is what's true for me now. And I still love animals. I'm still an environmentalist. And those things can all be true at once. Yes. And the public shaming was swift and vicious. And now when I came out as no longer vegan, the there were quite a few in that community that were, you know, unhappy with me, to say you the were, least. You were getting death threats, weren't you? Death threats, thousands of comments, thousands of emails, actual friends unfriending me in real life, not just on Facebook. Oh, wow. Um, so it's scary. And I began to realize that women are so afraid of screwing up their food or doing food wrong. Because on some level, we're all afraid of this. We're all afraid of being publicly shamed. Mm-hmm. And it's what Brene Brown has now been doing so much research about, um, you know, John Ronson's books about, about public shaming. They're studying the fear, the underlying fear that keeps us all in line in so many ways, or keeps us from, you know, trying something new or different or following our soul calling is, is the fear of shame. Yeah. It's very powerful. But I've worked with so many clients in the last few years that they're curious. They want to know what their cravings mean for them. And they're tired of being afraid to be themselves. And they want to find something that's more authentic. So that's where this book came from. That's fantastic. So you're talking a little bit about how people want to know a little bit more about where their cravings come from. And when I speak to women from my tribe, they're, you know, I, I hear about carbs, sugar is obviously a huge one. Mm-hmm. Some people are like, I'm not a sugar girl, I'm more of a salty kind of girl. You know, um, what are these, are there different sort of messages behind each of these cravings? Mm-hmm. So in, in terms of that, can you explain a little bit more? Because I know that you, you go into it a little bit in your book. Yeah. So there are four root causes to any craving, four possible underlying causes. The first is bacterial, then there's nutritional, emotional, and physical. And the bacterial cravings is what I experienced. My first, you know, my sugar addiction was bacterial imbalance. It was yeast overgrowth. Those fungi and those yeast, they crave sugar and they communicate with your body. You know, there's 10 times more bacterial or yeast cells in the body than human cells. We know this now. Uh, I always jokingly referred to them as the beast within or the puppet (laughs) master. And it's true. It's true. The bacteria in our gut, they communicate with our nervous system via the vagus nerve. They are the ones getting you off the couch at 1030 at night to go to the freezer to get the Ben and Jerry's out of the fridge. They're literally driving the show. Yep. 
And when you have an imbalance and and you start to go off sugar to balance that, there you and you feel it bad, you feel like you're dying, part of you is dying because those bacteria are dying off. They're being starved of their food source. So that bacterial thing, it's very real. And there's, you know, tons of protocols and I'm sure your work, Melissa, takes people through how to balance your bacteria in your body. Because I but think then a lot of people think that like, you know, I think it, probably when you studied school as well, same with me, it was, you put food in your mouth, it goes into your stomach and they talk about digestion, but even then they didn't speak about to what degree how our bacteria actually influences the second that if you have, I was saying this in one of my webinars, that if you have a lot of uh, fat, but if that fat is mixed with excess carbohydrates, the way that they actually communicate with the gut bacteria can end up creating endotoxins, so toxins within our system. So it's more than just, hey, I eat and it assimilates and I poop it out. It's so different. It is so different. And the more fiber you have in your diet from real raw fruits and veggies, you know, the more balanced your bacteria will be in the healthier way. So it's incredible what we're learning now. It's like the wild west of nutrition is this <laughs> microbiome, you know, and then there's the nutritional cravings. Yeah. And most of us are overfed and undernourished. And we get plenty of calories. We've got lots of food choices, but we're eating foods that are depleted and we're deprived. We're walking around with magnesium deficiencies or, you know, a variety of, you know, we're fine with the macronutrients usually, but it's the minerals. It's the trace elements that we're missing. And your body needs those. Yep. It needs iron. It needs magnesium to perform ba basic functions. So if it's not getting enough, it will continue to crave food until it gets the bare minimum. So for women, and I've definitely experienced this, for women, we become serious chocoholics when we're magnesium deficient. Big time. I will run over squirrels to get chocolate when I'm <laughs> just like, give me my chocolate. <laughs> it's amazing since I started taking magnesium supplements, how much I'm, I'm like, yeah, I can kind of take it or leave it. Yep. It's like, I never really thought that was possible. And then I started supplementing properly. And I do believe that a lot of people just need supplementation because it's hard. It's almost impossible to get the nutrients you need out of food these days for the stressful life we live. But your chocolate cravings will reduce when you get enough magnesium in your body. Mm -hmm. Now there's other foods that you can eat to start tapering that off. Like, you know, chia seeds, hemp seeds, certain sea veggies, you can include those. And so, so your body knows your body is so wise. She or he will, you know, I call my body a she so that she's more like my friend rather than an it. Um, she will crave food so that you get what you need so that she gets the basic building blocks. Mm -hmm. And we don't understand that. We're just like, oh, I have no willpower. Oh, I'm such a loser. I'm like, no, you actually need certain things. Yep. So then there's the emotional cravings. And this is what I feel so many um, diet programs and health classes, they miss that we are emotional creatures. You know, I have people say to me in this kind of shameful voice, I'm an emotional eater. I'm like, sweetie, we're all emotional eaters. Yeah. We're human beings. And food is one of the most basic parts of building culture. It builds rapport. It connects us to our family. It's also the most intimate thing we do with other people in public. You know, we share, we're taking something into our body. Oh, for sure. It can be a very spiritual, it can be a very powerful, a very loving experience. And your body also knows that food will calm you down or wake you up or help you feel relaxed or help you deal with anger. And a lot of us are not practiced in registering what our emotional state is. We just go straight to, I want to feel better right now. Mm -hmm. So we are emotional eaters. It's always there with us at the table. We just, if you just start bringing awareness to it, you can start to iron those things out. And so much of the book is about that. And then there's the physical cravings. You know, we are physical beings. 
(laughs) (laughs) We're, We're animal humans. For sure. And we need to move, we need to rest, and we need pleasure. We need play. The human being learns best while playing because it takes judgment out of it and we get fun and engaged in something. We get into flow states. That's a very powerful place. It's like, it's like awe. It's like spirituality. These have physical components to them for so many people. But we as adults forget that we're supposed to have fun in our bodies. We're just work, responsibility. We go work out. We go exercise. We don't have fun. Yeah. And it's, I love it because even when I see sometimes like your Instagram feed, which I love, you'll have like, oh, here's Alex and she's in her pink roller skates. Like you just, it's always like this awesome, playful part of you that just shines out and the positive uh, sexual relations, you know, with your spouse is always super important and all those different healthy aspects of play wrapping in. Like I looked on Etsy the other day and I was like a coloring book. I don't remember coloring since I was a kid, like small facets of play like that are just so crucial I think to the human body I have three coloring books I have a hula hoop I have a trampoline I have a slack line up on the roof so we can like you know practice our high wire act nice Um, yeah you know we know from plenty of animal studies and from child psychology that children and small mammals they need touch they need physical affection they need hugs and if you don't get give that to little creatures and little people, they won't thrive and mm-hmm. they will develop emotional problems. Mm-hmm. Adults are the same. Yeah. We need we need sometimes scientists believe we need six to eight hugs a day of at least six seconds in duration a piece. You should be getting like sixty seconds worth of hugging a day. When was the last time that happened? No kidding. Even for married people. For sure. Versus the little touch. Yeah. No, and it's uncomfortable. I do this in my workshops. I have people turn to the person next to you and you're going to hug each other and I'm going to count to six and then you can let go. And people are by a second three, they're like, oh my God, is it over yet? (laughs) But it's so good for us. We release endorphins, we release dopamine, oxytocin, all those pleasure and happy neurochemicals just go bing. Because you know what it reminds me of, though? It reminds me of that one video. I don't know if you remember seeing it where they uh, just stared into each other's eyes. Mm-hmm. And it was just, it was like couples that just stared into each other's eyes. And I don't, I think even some of them were like a son and his father. Like they were just like relatives or lovers. And that moment, and I, th- I can't remember how long it was. I think it was a duration of even eight minutes. Like it was a long period. Yeah. But the connection that they got that some people were actually crying throughout it. Did you do it? Oh, I've done it. Oh, fantastic. And you can do it with a perfect stranger, somebody you don't even really know. And you see, oh my gosh, like people are good. People want to be loved. Yeah. And underneath all of our faults, we're all worthy of that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we women especially are so hard on ourselves when we really, I believe we deserve a lot more play and a lot more fun, a lot more pleasure in our lives. And there's so much good science to back this up. And when you give yourself that fullness, that rich life experience, more sweetness in your life, then you're able to, A, be relaxed in your body, which always leads to this, you know, the chemical and the metabolic state where you can lose weight and actually have that, that right, like acid alkaline balance in your body. Stress definitely affects all that. For sure. And the emotional food cravings relax and you eat what's appropriate for you and how much is appropriate for you. So your cravings have really important information in them. That's amazing. And so, you know, if someone is, we talked a little bit about the third one, which I find when I speak to my tribe, it's emotions. I'm an emotional Mm -hmm. eater. So if someone, I remember when I had um, the breakup of my first love, I was devastated. And I remember I couldn't, generally when I get stressed, I like, I'm an emotional eater. I hoard food, like just as much as I can get in me. But at that point, 
I literally was starving my body because anything I put in, I would instantly become nauseous. Mm-hmm. So it was like, I would think I was like living off of coffee and I'm, but I couldn't eat anything. And I just, I lost probably upwards to 15 pounds in like under two weeks. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It was pretty crazy. And you know, I just wonder in terms of those moments where things are so um, emotionally devastating for someone, whether they're eating a lot or whether they're emotionally starving themselves, what can they do at that moment to be able to reconnect? So there's a, there's a few things. One which is so important is your community. You know, who are you hanging out with? Are you hanging out with anyone at all? Or are you really sequestering yourself in your pain? Which is very natural. I mean, you see animals do this. When a dog gets sick, they just go into a dark corner until they feel better, right? Yeah. But we are hypersocial animals, the human species, and we need each other. But a lot of us feel a lot of shame. And again, shame is at the root of a lot of violence. It's at the root of a lot of emotional eating and, you know, violence towards others and towards ourselves. And the only antidote for shame is to share and be vulnerable with other people about what's going on for you. Yeah. It's the only antidote. And that requires bravery, which doesn't mean that you get over your fear. It means you feel your fear and you show up and you do it anyway. And, You know, there's this idea in positive psychology that you are the five people you hang out with most. Yeah. You know, we have mirror neurons. We mirror and copy and embrace and adopt the habits and the ways of being of the people we hang out with. It keeps us in rapport. It keeps us as a tribe. But who are you hanging out with? You know, I actually, when I was going through my divorce, there were a couple of friends I kind of had to move away from because they were very invested in digging into my wounds with me to try to like be my friend. They were like, oh, let's talk about that terrible thing that happened again. Yeah. I was like, I really don't want to, that's, you know, that's why a lot of traditional therapy didn't feel good to me. I was like, I, I don't want to talk about, like, I've seen it. I've talked about it. Like, let's talk about the other stuff and how it's, in, you know, anyway. There, there are people that in your life that might be a little toxic yeah, or just not in the frame of mind that you feel is best for you. So who are you hanging out with? That makes a huge impact. And the self-care, oh my gosh. I mean, the massages, that healing touch, the day off. I prescribe pleasure play dates for people all the time, which is 12 full hours of just time for you. Yeah. Do you want to take the day off from work? Use one of your holidays and go have a long breakfast with a girlfriend and then go see a movie or go to a day spa or go on a nature hike. And or disconnect. Just disconnect. Yeah. It's so powerful. Big but time. We, yeah, we don't, we don't allow those things for ourselves. So how can we be more mindful when we're eating? Like when we're... When we're going through, I think that especially when I speak to women, when they're when they're eating a meal, even I and I will say that I'm I'm a lot like this too sometimes, where it tastes so good that mm-hmm. I'm just scarfing it down, and mm-hmm. I'm really not being mindful. I'm not being mindful of the taste. Like in Chinese medicine, um, various tastes will have um, therapeutic properties because they right. nourish specific meridians in the body. So how can we be mindful the next time that we're sitting at the dinner table? And I mean, the French do this incredibly well. Oh my God. I was just talking about this with a client today. She's having all these, all this bloating issues. And, we, and I talked her through, okay, tell me how you eat, not what you eat, just how do you eat? She spends five minutes a day on breakfast, eats at her desk all day long, and then rushes through dinner so she can go out at night. It's like, so you spend about 25, 30 minutes a day actually eating. Mm. But we're obsessed with food. We spend all this time obsessing about food in our bodies, but we spend very little time actually enjoying food. Yeah. Let's flip that. Yeah. When we're at a meal, like be at your meal quadruple the amount of time you actually spend eating. And for most people, that means you're going to be sitting at the table for a whole 30 minutes. (laughs) (laughs) Go figure. Whoa, crazy. (laughs) 
And by the way, most jobs require you to have a lunch break. Yeah. I can't tell you how many times I've had to, like, just for one week, take a lunch break every day away from your computer. When you sit and you have a napkin and you sit with somebody you like or you go sit and eat outside and you just relax, that is a completely different state of being. You can either be stressed or you can digest. Your body cannot do both at the same time. No. Your digestion shuts down. So for the people who don't know how to do mindful eating, I actually call it soulful eating. I'm like, mindful eating, intuitive eating, that sounds really boring, honestly. (laughs) Soulful eating is like, I'm going to enjoy this meal and I'm going to bring into my choice about what I'm going to eat. How is this meal and how I eat it going to affect the rest of my day and my big goals in life and my tomorrow? Like... I want this to be part of the story of my life yeah, and how I care for myself. So make it an event. Every single meal should be an event. Even if it's in an airport between flights, how can you be in the movie of your life with this meal and make it more enjoyable? Because it really is like you were saying, you can't digest and you can't be stressed. You can't digest and you can't, you know, be stressed. Well, you can do it at the same time. It's just it, it'll be separated. If you try to be stressed and yeah. digest, your body can't do it. You get bloated. And I tell people um, the reason why that a lot of people get heartburn is not because they have too much acid. It's because of the flip side is because you don't have enough of it. And you don't have enough of it because most people would say to you, I'm stressed. When you're stressed, your stomach acid shuts down. It's like, exactly. forget it. I'm not doing this. Yeah. So you I can, totally get it. You can't do them both at the same time. Just try that for a week, one week. Give me a week of relaxed eating. Pretend you're French. Yeah. And then come back to me, and then we'll start talking about the ingredients of what you're eating. But let's do this first. Yeah, because it's really important. Um, You spoke a lot about – you had a section, at least in your book, that I really liked, and it was entitled, I Heart My Body. Uh. And so can you tell us a little bit about this – part in the book because I, I loved it like that that I it stuck out to me because I was like I heart my body I love my body and talking a lot about nourishing the heart so tell mm. us a little bit about this well th- that goes into the emotional and the physical cravings that my my your body our bodies are we got a short window of time mm-hmm. on this planet And if you can remember back to what it was like when you were a kid, seven or eight, and how much fun you used to have. I mean, my whole life was about playing. And it was flip-flops and a towel over my shoulder and riding my bike down to the swim park. You know, that was my whole summer. And now I have to be a lot more mindful about how I give my body those same experiences, have fun in myself. Luckily, I have an eight-year-old kid who we just got back from a bike ride. And I was like, thank goodness, I have him as an excuse to get me out of the house and Mm -hmm. go play. But it was also, you know, it's also about my evening ritual. Like, how do I put myself to bed? You know, I take a little hot shower. I get some almond oil and some essential oils, and I give myself a little foot rub just to calm my body down at night. You know, I have sheets that I love. I have, you know, jammies that feel really good. There's so many things that you can be doing, including, you know, whether you're in a relationship or not, but self-pleasure, one of the best hormonal balancing techniques, which is free and you can do by yourself or with a friend. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. And it really is about, the whole part of it is about, self-love because I think we get so caught up in our day-to-day that we forget about the small things that really require self-care and it was something that um, when I created the stress detox program you know I did it because I got into such a massive adrenal fatigue and I always say to people I'm like you know self-care comes before supplementation so if you think that supplementation is Like right up here, super important. I'm like, if you you can pop all the supplements you want, you can eat all the food that you want, but 
if you are not giving yourself that self-care, whether it's that time off, the play factor, um, the rest, like, you know, and you have a whole chapter in your book about sleep, mm-hmm. about how important it is to sleep, all oh, these things. Gosh. Like you've got, you know, Ariana Huffington who calls herself the sleep connoisseur for a reason because of the fact that it's so important for us to thrive in so many aspects. And you don't know how important sleep is until you have a year and a half of insomnia like I did. Aww. It's horrific. It And it causes this cascade, this domino effect of health problems that I couldn't recover from. Even, I mean, I've been in this health business for 16 years now. Everything else I did didn't matter. It was about that one thing. Yeah. And it's it's a challenge, man. I know that a lot of people are experiencing this because your hormones do change as you age and you have to like readdress. Okay, I used to have this down easy. Now I got to change things, make it real for what's happening now. Yeah. And so we were talking a little bit earlier about the the specific cravings and the types of the reasons why we crave various foods. So if, if I'm someone who has a salty craving, is there something mm-hmm. specific um, that that means? Like, I'm craving salt. Is there something specific that that means? It could be a, a trace element or a mineral deficiency. Got it. You know, it's, it's kind of like the magnesium issue with chocolate. You know, we might just need a, a good mineral supplement. Yeah. Or, you know, sea veggies are a great way to, and you got to get, you know, the good quality sea veggies for sure. I love the stuff from Maine is great. That's pretty clean. Yeah. Um, or any of those, those uh, like spirulina, those are, you know, those super green foods are helpful. I actually, I take a nighttime, you know, multi-mineral supplement and it's amazing. It's been, I feel like I've been so calm since I started taking these supplements, but you really can do it with food. And you know, there's nothing wrong with getting a blood test to see how your vitamins and minerals are doing. It's really a good idea. Yeah, and I think it's funny that you mentioned this because in Chinese medicine, when someone is craving salt, it has to do with kidney function and people go, oh no, my kidneys, are they bad? It's, it's not that, it's just, it's, they don't talk about adrenal fatigue, it's more like kidney yin deficiency. And all the things that strengthen the kidneys Right. Are sea vegetables, the minerals. It's the same thing. We're just saying it in a different way, but it's the exact right. same thing. Yeah, you yeah, know? that's cool. And I've got like my own mineral supplement that I take. It's in a powder form from this company, St. Francis, that it's like this dehydrated uh, goat's whey, which is not protein, it's just the minerals. Mm-hmm. And you pour it into some hot water and it's fantastic, but it puts me to bed like a baby. Like, that's amazing. awesome. Oh, I'm going to have to try some. Yeah, I'll definitely ship you some over. <laughs> Yay, cool. Um, I want to ask you a little bit about detoxing um, because there are some people who I know that detox, and when they detox, they're doing it as like this short-term gain, and mm-hmm. sometimes detoxing can have a very negative connotation, and you're looking at this, like, look at this from a very holistic perspective. So can you give us your idea about detoxing a bit more? Yeah, you know, the thing that... It's that so many on on so many people's minds lately is this very popular Japanese book called The Magical Art of Tidying Up, mm-hmm. which is all about organizing. Yeah, and I we got really into it, and I love getting rid of stuff. I just like great. Get, I just want to burn it all. Like <laughs> I want less stuff in my life. And the way she talks about it is keep only the things that bring you joy. And in that way, it's really easy to let the st- extra stuff go because our lives are so filled. Like, I have enough. I am enough. I've had enough. <laughs> like, those, those are my, that's like my new mantra. And detox is the same way for me. It's not about trying to get my body to look like something. Yeah. It's about getting rid of the extra that's in the way of how I want to feel and how I want my life to be. So, you know, I pay, I take people through what I consider a very basic food elimination detox. Take out the food, the most common foods that are getting in the way of most of our joy and well-being and energy and happiness that we want in our bodies, mm-hmm. the brain fog, the low-level depression, the digestive issues, all those things. Let's take those out. And then we'll add them back in one at a time to see if they bring us joy or not. Yeah. And when you do that, I mean, it's a, it takes about a month, a little bit over a month 
to go through this whole process. And I've had people get in touch with me years later and they're like, I'm still so amazed that I can now make my food decisions based on how I want to feel, not based on, oh, is that, is that a good food or a bad food? Or have I been good enough? Do I deserve it? You know, that whole conversation just melts away. It's like, how does my body react to this? Mm-hmm. And how do I really want to feel? Yeah. And that's a great way to be with food. It's so easy. It's way easier. And when we're, when the average person is eating, at least I know for myself, I was saying to you uh, before we, we started you know, recording this call was my mother would say to me, I'm like a duck when I eat sometimes. It's like two chews and you swallow because I would, I'm just a fast eater. And mm-hmm. the thing, the problem with that is, is that when you're a really fast eater um, and you're not being mindful at the table, you end up getting super full. Mm-hmm. So even yourself in the book, you had mentioned that um, you had, you know, before it was like feeling heavy and bloated and so forth. So, you know, how can we be able to kind of feel a way our, around being full where mm-hmm. it's not like, because you have to wait a half an hour before those hunger signals kick in. Right. So what do you do? Right. Um, I. It's so funny. I feel like I was born with this gift <laughs> this understanding I've always my family has always joked that I'm the slowest eater really and I just never I was like god when I eat fast I just don't feel good like yeah. that's what it comes down to and I like to this is one of the first things that I teach when it comes to the mindset part of any of my courses I teach a lot of positive psychology and the first tool I use is savoring mm. And savoring is this incredible thing. It's awareness, but on a much more sensual level. Again, awareness, mindful eating, intuitive eating, it just feels so like dry. And to me, like food is one of the best things about being a human. It should be an experience. It's one of the greatest parts about this life. So savoring is about everything. It's not just about food. And I believe that it's best understood and best practiced in life, not just at the table, but you get into a moment and you really try to experience every moment, every mouthful and notice how you're feeling. What are your senses bringing into you right now and savoring and like, mmm, juicy, delicious sensations. What am I hearing? What am I seeing? How does the food smell? Oh, that's the other thing I get made fun of for. I smell almost everything before I put it in my mouth. (laughs) I just like, oh, yum. I mean, when you smell it, such a powerful sense. It's more powerful for us than taste even. And it has memory associated with it. And you taste more when you smell your food. So that's why cold food doesn't usually taste as good as hot food because the aromas are in the air so much. But you know, feeling and seeing and like, mmm, it's just like that mmm in life. So savoring is a skill. It's a strength that you can get better at. And I do do a whole module around savoring. And you can bring it into your work. You can bring it into how you experience your, your partner or your friends or anything in your life, not just food. It's savoring the moment. It is. It's savoring the moment. It's beautiful. And it means usually put away this thing, taking a picture of it is not savoring. No. (laughs) Be there for it. Yeah. No, I hear that. Well, I think the book, this book is fantastic. I mean, you have gone into everything, especially um, helping us release a lot of the habits that we have created over time, helping people understand you know, a deeper connection with their bodies. If you guys haven't picked up this book, do so. It is being translated into Lord knows how many languages and probably even more. I'm going to see it in like, has it been translated to like Italian or? Um, Let's see. We've got it in German. We've got it in Czech. We've got it in Chinese. We've got it in all kinds of stuff. It's awesome. How wild. Well, I think it's fantastic. I love the cover of the book. I think it's amazing, and I'm just so proud of you and everything that you're doing, and you're rocking out, girl. So thank you for sharing all your wisdom with my tribe. 
Thank you. It's great. Yeah, and if you guys haven't picked it up, pick up Women, Food, and Desire. You can pick it up on Amazon. Um, and yeah, check out Alexandra Jameson's site. Is it alexandrajameson.com? It is. And check yes. her out and check out all the goodness that she has to offer. And you know what? They can email me the receipt and I'll send them a whole bunch of bonuses, bunch of interviews I did in addition to the book that really complement it. Sweet. Yeah. Sweet. Definitely get on that, guys. I will have all the information uh, below so that you guys have all the info to uh, link up to. And that's it. Thank you so much, Alex, for this time. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, honey.